Hola, mi nombre es John Moravec y soy el fundador del Education Futures. Soy un investigador sobre el futuro de la educación. No estoy muy seguro con mi español, así que por favor perdona mi inglés. And especially thank you to the conference organizers for helping to provide subtitles. In my work, I've been thinking about basic questions regarding learning at our schools. What are we educating for? What are the outcomes that we want? Why do we do it? How is the best way? And for whom is this all supposed to benefit? Five years ago, Cristobal Cobo and I published the book Aprendizaje Invisible, Invisible Learning. It's available for free at aprendizajeinvisible.com. And this work analyzed the impact of technological advances and changes in formal, non-formal, and informal education and the fuzzy meta spaces in between. And the product was a journey that offered an, oper an overview of options for the future development of education and learning that are really relevant for our century. So invisible learning recognizes that most of what we learn is invisible. That is, we learn all the time without realizing it. And this particularly embraces non-formal, informal, and serendipitous forms. It just happens. It's not focused on formal learning. So this is a bit of an archetype or a new concept that presents a new ecology of options. It's a collection of ideas and combinations and reflections on learning as a continuum that extends throughout life, in any time, in any place. And so this perspective helps us to think about how we can make education more relevant and reduce the gap between what is taught in formal education and what labor markets and society really demand. So think about something you learned just because you're curious. How did you do it? Chances are it didn't happen because of formal instruction. We don't know how much we learn is invisible versus visible, but John Seeley Brown guesstimates that the ratio is about five to one. That is, for every six things that we learn, five are not in formal education. And we're talking about skills and competencies for future careers. It is likely that most of them are not being developed in schools. In the invisible learning proto-paradigm, the inherent chaos and ambiguity that's related to tremendous technological and social changes really call for a resurgence of learning by doing. In a sense, we're creating the future as we go along and without a master plan to follow. And so we all become co-learners, we all become co-teachers, and we're all co-responsible for helping each other find our own elements along our pathways of personal nomadic development. And so this is what we had to say what, what invisible learning was up until recently. We said that it takes into account the impact of technological advances and changes in formal, non-formal, and informal education, in addition to the fuzzy meta spaces in between. And I really apologize, because we seem to have gotten a bit hung up or obsessed about technology. And to be very clear, invisible learning is not about computers. It's about connecting with ourselves as humans and embracing the human experience and trusting each other to learn. So today, uh, through this talk, I hope to fix that a bit. Um, and to also help us think about technologies in a way that better support invisible learning. Invisible learning is really about trust and recognizing that learning cannot be dictated to us. I love this quote from the Little Prince. It says, it is only the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. So in other words, learning is directed from the heart as we seek our own passions. A lot has changed since we wrote the book in 2011 and we need a formal theory for invisible learning more than ever. And technology is not the point, but rather placing trust in kids and getting away from power games and control in schools. So our first need is that society needs nomadic workers that work with context, not rigid structure. And one reality that we're facing today is that jobs schools typically prepare us for, that is work as factory workers, bureaucrats, or soldiers, are just simply disappearing. They're being replaced with knowledge and innovation-based work, which require people to function contextually, working almost anytime, anywhere, and with nearly anybody. And so I like to call these emerging workers nomads, K-N-O-W-M-A-D-S, nomadic knowledge workers. And they apply their individual knowledge across different gigs or contingent engagements to create new value. Now, this is a, this is a big change because by the year 2020, we project that 45% of the workforce in the United States will be nomadic. And this is a huge shift, considering that only 6% of the United States was self-employed, contingent, or some sort of nomadic worker in 1989. This is a huge growth. 
Second, many beliefs and practices in mainstream education are very old and have no grounding in reality. It would be very hard-pressed to find a study that argues that kids learn best from 7.45 in the morning until 2.37 p.m., yet we model our schools around absurd hours and times that better mirror the sort of industrial practices that are really fading into extinction. We further separate kids by age or by grades, and we assume that kids learn best when they're separated from each other. This is simply not true. And we too often assume that motivation must be extrinsic. That is, we've grown to believe that kids will not learn anything unless they're told what to learn. And this cannot be any further from reality, as it can be argued that kids' main activity is learning whether or not it's within a school format. Even more troubling, the most meaningful way that kids learn, that is through play, curiosity, and exploration, are really discounted in formal learning, unless it's sort of directed in a top-down, structured activity. How can we dare say that we're enabling kids' curiosity if we're telling them what to be curious about? How can we justify labeling activities as exploration if we already know the destination? And why are we so afraid to allow children to play freely? Finally, we simply cannot measure a person's knowledge. Tests only measure how well a student completes a test. And we've become really obsessed with PISA internationally. And right now, Finland is home to some of the best test takers in the world. That's like being the best looking kid in an ugly family. Skills and non-cognitive skills can be difficult or impossible to measure. Yet we've become obsessed with measurement in schools so much that we've convinced ourselves that we can measure what a person knows. This is not true. We simply cannot measure what's inside of a person's head. At the same time, yes, we do need to demonstrate accountability in our schools. We should not value what we measure, but rather measure what we value. We need to find a way beyond beyond high-stakes testing that do little to review what students know. It is time to focus on what we value as as individuals, as schools, and within our communities. So when we wrote Invisible Learning five years ago, we initially structured it as a meta-theory, which recognizes that most of the learning that we do is invisible, that is through informal, non-formal, or serendipitous experiences, but not so much through formal instruction. We can learn alone, we can learn in groups, and we learn through individual and shared experiences. We learn more through experimentation, exploration, and through the consequences of enabling serendipity. And even though we cannot measure the knowledge in our heads, the consensus is that the vast majority of our knowledge is developed through invisible or informal needs. So invisible learning is not a theory for learning in itself. Rather, it's an endpoint or a state of learning that emerges when we, when we remove these structures of control that direct our experiences. Therefore, the theory for invisible learning is that we learn more, we do so invisibly, And this happens when we separate structures of control that restrict freedom and self-determination from learning experiences. Removing structures of control opens possibilities. The end outcomes or goals of an experience are neither dictated nor determined from the start, but instead emerge as learning develops. And such experiences include free play, self-organized learning communities, authentic problem-based learning, and experimentation to acquire new knowledge. A theory for invisible learning is focused on the development of personal knowledge, Those are the blends of tacit and explicit elements that embrace a portfolio of skills such as cooperation or empathy, critical thinking, embraces these as much as, say, retaining facts. And the implication is that there is no master template for invisible learning, but rather we need to attend to the formation of an ecology of options for for individuals to better find their own ways. Invisible learning is about placing trust in learners and shifting the flow of power from the top down to the learner out. And this suggests a growing need for bottom-up or learner-out approaches to learning. And so by removing the rigidity of top-down control and placing more trust in learners, invisible learning can be made visible. The whole purpose of controlling an educational experience is to make learning visible. It's built on distrust of a learner or the false assumption that students will not learn unless if they're told what to learn. In a sense, invisible learning is the end product of this theory, right? which predicts that learning may blossom when we eliminate authoritarian control or direction of a learning experience by another, like by a teacher, or by a predefined curricular path, like what we often produce in learning software. So I have three approaches I want to share for invisible learning. And invisible learning can emerge in a a variety of ways, and it often manifests itself in bits and pieces here and there, And the examples of approaches to invisible learning I share are not meant to be exhaustive or complete in any way. 
they're really just illustrative. There are many more approaches that we can find and share. And so each of these approaches I, I am sharing though are really focused on participation, play, and exploration. The first area, I think we can look at some schools. There are some great examples of schools and innovative programs which are doing some great things. Uh, for me, I, I find that democratic schools are probably the best examples of enabling self-determination. And within these Sudbury type schools, embrace the uh, democratic principles at their core, providing each student an equal voice and vote alongside staff members and other stake stakeholders as to what to learn and how their, their schools are run. And students spend their time together without age or grade separation, and they decide how they spend their whole time throughout the days at school. And central to the school operation are school meetings, in which students and staff members make key decisions in a process as focused on participatory democracy. In these schools, students are afforded tremendous freedom together with the, their own personal and collective responsibility to make some of the best decisions possible. Now, these schools are part of a broader category of free schools, which developed over the past century. And there are many different approaches that interpret free. Um, some operate as full democracies, and others really look like anarchist collectives. But there is very little research on democratic and free schools compared to mainstream education. But my hunch is that they best serve students of at least a middle class or better educated families where students have greater flexibility and support to pursue their own interests. For students in economically disadvantaged families, I think we can look into liberation pedagogies such as critical pedagogy, eco schools, and praxis type schools as pathways. While their foci are often connected with particular ideologies, they share core themes of socioeconomic liberation for students in the communities in which they live. Finally, youth organizations and community participation opportunities that exist, often connected through, through formal schools, uh, provide pathways towards invisible learning. Most often we see this through scouting, we see it through clubs, we see it through extension programs where students are not evaluated on a rigorous program, but they instead earn badges, they develop creative products, and they create community, create community relevant outcomes that are really based on their own interests. The second area is free play and exploration. Free play, that is play without direction, is a most natural human activity where invisible learning flourishes. Through play, children discover their interests, they discover their aptitudes. Play inspires curiosity to test boundaries and learn social rules and, and learn social rules and norms, together with the development of many soft skills. Unfortunately, mainstream approaches to education ignore or underplay the importance of play and learning. Now, play is separate from sports or other organized activities in that it is explore, it's explorative. Uh, it satisfies an individual's curiosity to try new ideas or to simulate different possibilities in the world. Through play, a learner's environment becomes his or her laboratory. And the satisfaction of curiosity encourages the development of autodidacticism or the practice of learning by oneself. And very similar to free play is free exploration. And this can occur within our own communities and beyond to learn from others. What happens, for example, when children learn or explore a culture beyond their own? What do they discover? How does it change them? What skills, competencies, or insights might they develop? And most of the answers to these questions are really difficult to, to answer or to quantify or measure. But research suggests that they be related through the development of soft skills, like intercultural competence, capabilities to handle ambiguity, empathy. And these are all critical products of invisible learning. This is learning beyond any core curricula, and it places trust in kids that they, that they can develop their own knowledge and skills. Finally, to break free from the structures of control, we need to build cultures of trust. We need to trust children to learn without being told what to learn. Democracies are built in trust and shared responsibility. Free play and exploration are built in trusting each other to learn from each other. Now, teachers and school leaders have many opportunities to develop, to develop pathways towards invisible learning through participation, play, and exploration. And these can be realized through their own development and their own praxis, as well as their own work as students. But the bottom line is enabling invisible learning is centered on trust and trusting that children always learn, no matter what. And as we wrote in Manifesto 15, 
Failing is a natural part of learning where we can always try again. In a flat learning environment, the teacher's role is to help make sure the learner makes a well-balanced decision. Failing is okay, but the creation of failures is not. And if you have not read or signed it yet, Manifesto 15 is available at manifesto15.org. And it's available in Spanish and in 18 other languages right now. And that is a theory for invisible learning. Yorke. And now what? What do we do with technologies? What can we as developers and innovators do to make the best use of technologies? And I'm not aware of a single case of a miracle of technology that really improves learning when it is forced upon by students or schools. And as my wife says, the best way to ruin the student's love of technologies is to force them to learn with them. There is no better way to ruin a kid's love of Minecraft than to force him or her to use it as a teacher-directed assignment within schools. The same goes within Pokemon Go, right? These are games that encourage kids to learn on their own, they build things of interest to them, and they make connections with their own communities. However, even today, my Twitter feed is full of teachers talking about ways to bring these games into their classrooms. And that's just ridiculous. These are games uh, that enable free play and invisible learning. So I think the bottom line when we, we look at how we use technologies is that we need to stop controlling students. We have a growing need for bottom-up or learner-out approaches to learning. And again, the purpose of controlling an educational experience is to make learning visible. It is built on distrust of the learner. If we want to enable invisible learning through technologies, we have to enable trust and reduce the amount of control over learning experiences. And so by removing the rigidity of top-down control through educational technologies and placing trust in learners, invisible learning can be made more visible. So stop using technology to control learning experiences. We need to stop using technology to, to create predetermined uh, learning outcomes. We have to stop expecting kids to, le to love these technologies that we're creating that are really just to teach the same old stuff. Instead, we need to think about how we can use technologies to open ecologies of student-led learning through invisible approaches. So thank you for your, uh, for your attention and your time on this, and I look forward to our discussion in the upcoming minutes.